Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the Avexia webinar series. Our topic for today is Introduction to Epigenetic Methylation and Advanced Biological Age Testing. My name is Christopher Chu. I'm the Director of Marketing for Vexia Diagnostics and will be your host for this webinar. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of being joined by our special guest, Hannah Wen, co-founder of True Diagnostic, who will be our presenter for this webinar. Hannah Wendt has a lifelong passion for longevity and breakthrough, disruptive technologies that drive radical improvement to the human condition. She attended the University of Kentucky and graduated with a degree in biology. During that time, she had multiple research internships studying cell signaling and cell biology. After graduation, she worked for the International Peptide Society as their director of research and content. Through work in the integrative medicine industry, Hannah saw an opportunity methylation-based age diagnostics and started True Diagnostics in 2020. Without further delay, I will now turn the webinar over to Hannah. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. My name is Hannah Wench. I'm the co-founder at True Diagnostic and work with our healthcare providers in partnerships to bring biological age testing to their clinic making sure that they understand how important these outcomes are as it relates to their patient's health and how they can make this as clinically applicable as possible while also teaching them monetization and marketing strategies on how to push this testing in their practice and make it a reoccurring business model for them. Today, I'm here to talk to you about just that. What is biological aging? How do we actually measure this? Why is it important? And what can we offer you from a reporting standpoint? So we'll review what geroscience really means and get to our age outcomes and reporting toward the end of this call. A little bit about true diagnostic and who we are. We are an epigenetic biological age testing company that was founded about four years ago. And to date, we've tested about 75,000 samples. Those are usually patients or clients from healthcare providers in the integrative, functional, all cash pay medicine space. We also perform a lot of research at our facility in Lexington, Kentucky. We actually own the lab and do this processing in-house from start to finish. You can view some of my biological aging research here. We have published with a lot of top universities such as Harvard, Stanford, the Buck Institute for Aging, Yale, and many others as well. But first, before we want to get started, I do just want to explicitly state the difference between chronological age and biological age. What is this? What does this really mean? Well, we're using aging to really predict the biggest risk factor and make changes to actually reduce those risks. When you think of aging, you may think of some common outward expressions this is called a phenotype, like wrinkles, gray hair, health issues, or limited physical mobility. Um, and these visible traits are reflected of complex biological processes occurring in your body, processes that are interconnected, they're occurring at the molecular level all the way down to the DNA. But the difference in each of our biological or mileage is the reason why we may look and feel significantly older or younger than others who share the same birth year as us. So just to give you those definitions, chronological age is the extent of time, right? It's how long we're on this earth. It's our calendar age. It's the number of years that have passed since our birth. This number is fixed. It's linear. It does not change to reflect improvements or declines in health or physical capabilities. But your biological age is the extent of damage. You can see here in this picture, all of these people are 45 years old chronologically, for example, but they look very, very different. So again, it's that cellular age. It's a calculation of the toll that life has taken on your body and a number that can fluctuate based on various lifestyle, environment, and or medical issues. So why is this important though? Well, according to the World Health Organization, aging is the number one risk factor for almost every single chronic disease and death. We use 
epigenetics, which I will define soon, to quantify the extent of multiomic aging within your patients to help you tailor treatment and gauge the success of recently prescribed regimens. The graph, for example, on the left-hand side shows the top three causes in the U.S. for death in 2020. You have heart disease, cancer, and COVID-19. And then the relative risk of that disease is caused by aging. And that aging category far exceeds factors like smoking, obesity, um, male versus female. So we believe quantifying aging, especially on a molecular basis, is important regardless of any other health factors. Not only is it important as it relates to all health outcomes, it's also important because it has a massive economic value. So if we target aging, we can actually extend life expectancy by one year. And if we did that, we would increase the productivity in the U.S. by $38 trillion compared to U.S. debt at $24 trillion. Now, I want to also just talk about something um, really quickly and differentiate uh, genetics versus epigenetic testing, right? What, what's the difference here? Well, just very briefly, your genome or your hardware that comes pre-installed only accounts for about 20% of your entire health outcomes. This is what diseases you get when you die and how you feel and perform today. That's more of that nature category. It's the same in every single cell type. It's inherited by our parents, 50% from parent one, 50% from parent two. And you can only measure these once. You can't really change your, your genetic risk, your, your heritable risk. But the other 80% is your epigenetics. It's determined by everything you do, what you eat, how you sleep, exercise, stress. It's everything in your environment and what we know as the nurture these epigenetic markers are different in almost every single cell type. Some signals can be inherited, but most are not for the purpose of this call. And since these markers change across our lifetime, we can remeasure them. So the epigenetic testing, what I'm going to be talking to you about today, can be more clinically informative since we can change the markers and actually affect risk. So you can see here in this image with the tools at your disposal, nutrition, stress, toxins, pathogens, others like supplements, medications, or procedural based therapies, your epigenome is changing. All right. Now, how does this relate to, to biological aging back to aging? Well, uh, we can quantify biological aging. Previously, it's been measured through all sorts of different ways, and I've placed a couple of them here, through telomeres, through grip strength, through gait speed, through cognitive function, through facial aging, through specific, just very simple blood-based equations. But we need to understand how each of these biological age clocks are measured. I'm here to talk to you, though, about epigenetics and why we believe this is the best way to measure biological aging. So what is epigenetics? Well, epi is just a Greek prefix. It means above or on top of. We're, we're quite literally looking at your DNA regulation. More specifically, we're studying DNA methylation. DNA methylation-based testing is becoming a very exciting point of clinical practice because it's really looking at what is happening in the DNA based on an individual basis instead of just looking at the infrastructure of DNA like you would do with your traditional genomic testing. So it's just the idea is, it's just the idea of, is there a CH3 group present or not? And here's what that looks like. It's like a light switch or light bulb example. Basically, if that methylation is not present, you're unmethylated and your gene expression is turned on. But if that methylation, that CH3 group is present, you're methylated and your gene expression is turned off. So it's a healthy balance. You want some genes turned on, and some genes turned off depending on the actual position. For example, you would want an oncogene or a cancer gene methylated and turned off, and you would want a tumor suppressor gene unmethylated and turned on to help suppress tumors. So when you take a sample at True Diagnostic, it's just a blood spot card for biological age testing, what can we tell from this epigenetic data just from a couple drops of, of, of blood, even outside of just the biological age that I've mentioned previously. Well, there are studies showing that if you ask someone how much they smoke or have smoked in the past, 
the result that you get from the drop of blood will be more accurate than their self-reported smoking status. There are even studies showing that you can tell what zip code someone has been in from the pollution markers that you find. We're actually working even on a study with Harvard right now um, where we can impute over 4,000 biomarkers that we call EBPs or epigenetic biomarker proxies. These include measurements like triglycerides, HbA1c, fasting glucose, CRP, and other common and uncommon biomarkers. And we know to test for all of those individually, it would cost thousands of dollars per patients with multiple liters of blood. So we're able to do that with massive data sets and advanced machine learning. In the study I'm talking about in particular, which I'll go over a little bit in depth later, we use metabolites, proteins, and clinical lab values to develop the algorithms to predict all these epigenetic biomarker proxies. So in the end, what you can predict with DNA methylation testing is only limited by the size of data set and our imagination, which is really exciting. Now, I want to give you one more real life example of the way we can benefit from this testing. I'm gonna give you a really odd example and talk about neurosyphilis. Right now, if you're a physician and you suspect someone of having neurosyphilis, it's a very difficult diagnosis to make. It's usually misdiagnosed for a few years, and then to get the final diagnosis, you must send your patient to the hospital to get a lumbar puncture. Way too expensive, right? It's about five to $10,000. It's invasive, it's painful, and there are multiple complications associated with it. The alternative is what we're doing with Cornell University right now, where we have a set of patients' blood that had neurosyphilis, and we can run this DNA methylation testing on it, and then use AI to compare the pattern for those a million methylation sites against controls who did not have neurosyphilis to find the exact epigenetic fingerprint of neurosyphilis. I give you that example because it's a real life one, it's happening right now, but this can be extrapolated to any disease. All right, so when it comes to epigenetics, again, we're limited by the data set and our imagination, and that's super, super powerful. So think of this again as a fingerprint. These markers are a fingerprint for almost any, any uh, health outcome, but specifically biological age, where we can make the biggest difference since it's our number one risk factor for all-cause mortality and morbidity. Again, I mentioned there are many different biological age clocks out there. So what should you be looking for in these biological epigenetic clocks? I have a list of five different points I want to walk you through that we believe are questions or topics you should look for when vetting these biological age clocks. And the first one is going to be that they must be published in peer-reviewed journals and predictive of death and disease outcomes. Personally, I think this is the most important um, and you can see that if you look historically in the literature, there are different clocks, right? These, these have gone through different iterations of development. Now, the first clocks, these are called first generation clocks, are going to be um, created by Dr. Steve Horvath and Dr. Gregory Hannum in 2013. This was really exciting. Um, it was a huge breakthrough in, in science because the predictive capability of these clocks were amazing. Again, we all know that age is the biggest risk factor for almost every chronic disease and death. It was clear that these clocks were way better at measuring um, health outcomes than just chronological age itself. These first clocks, however, were only trained to predict chronological age of the patient and tested. That's the definition of a first generation clock. And that's a problem. The problem is that we don't care about your chronological age of your patients, right? We only care about the biochemistry of aging. So how do we detect that better? Well, the answer is to measure and train these DNA methylation marker patterns to better measurements of aging rather than chronological age. It's how the second generation clocks were created. The three most popular second generation clocks are our omic MH that we have and our symphony age, where we're training these biomarkers on really massive data sets. All right, so these second generation clocks were much better. And how do we know that? Well, we know accelerated aging scores were even more predictive of negative health outcomes and deaccelerated aging scores were even more predictive of lower disease risk. Now, beyond this, the second generation clocks were also associated more highly with disease. Even then though, there was still some room for improvement because these second generation clocks were created with samples from many different uh, people over many different time points in their life. 
So to get another type of aging signal, it'd be best to follow the same individuals across their own life at various time points. And that's what we did with this Dunedin pace of aging. All right, this is what is called a third generation clock. Many of you may recognize the turtle and the bunny photo. Um, and unlike previous clocks, the Dunedin pace of aging is not trained on chronological age. It is the first clock to be trained entirely on phenotypes of aging in the same patients across their lifespan from age three to 53. And the study is still going on today. So this is really helpful because we aren't picking up noise in our measurements by following that same individual, right? We can make sure that things like environmental exposures aren't included in these clocks. And for example, 50 years ago, many people were exposed to more lead through gasoline, less antibiotics, less microplastics. And if we don't control for the time at which people lived, the algorithm may include markers that are associated with those exposures rather than just aging. All right. So no clock to date has done this. Again, it's a, a very exciting discovery and, and one that um, we will continue to follow up in that longitudinal cohort. Now, that was a lot, but I do think it's really important to understand that clinically, you only want to offer second and third generation clocks. So what's next? Number two, these have to be correlated with quality of life-based outcomes, health span and not just lifespan. Our definition here is lifespan is how long you're living on this earth, regardless of your health outcomes. Health span is defined as how many healthy years do you have at the end of your life? Because health span is, you know, just as equally important or more important than lifespan itself. And we show that in some of these clocks, in particular, that third generation clock in this example here, the Dunedin Pace variations impact facial aging. You saw this at the beginning of the talk where all of these people are from the Dunedin cohort and they're all 45 years old. However, you can see that these people on the right-hand side actually look older compared to the average and compared to the slowest aging members. So facial aging itself is going to show variations and the, the Dunedin pace, the algorithms are going to pick up on that. Same is true. Dunedin pace is also associated with things like grip strength, gait speed, cognitive function, and a lot of other functional physical, uh, physical function markers, excuse me. All right, what's next? Point number three, these clocks have to be accurate. And how do we define accuracy? So it's interesting because when it comes to epigenetic clocks, we can't be accurate. Accurate by definition means hitting that bullseye over and over and over again. But we really don't know someone's biological age. So instead of accuracy, we really use precision. How many times can we hit that same target over and over and over again? And in statistics, the intra-class correlation is going to be really useful here for this measurement. It's called the ICC. It's a statistic that can be used when quantitative measurements are made on units that are organized into groups. So it describes how strongly those units in the same group resemble each other. So again, are we able to hit that same spot on the dartboard over and over again? Really, you want a value above 0 0.9 to be considered excellent. And here you can actually see that the algorithms um, we, we want to look for is, again, as high as possible. In this case, would be 0 0.99. But anything really above 0 0.9 um, is, is looking to be pretty great. Number four, this one is fun to talk about. Um, do these clocks respond to interventions? And I'm not saying do we take an intervention and see 30 to 40 year age reductions. That is really not possible when it comes to these epigenetic clocks, because we know taking a specific intervention isn't physiologically going to make us 30 to 40 years younger. Now, I'm going to talk to you about a study that's really popular in the epigenetic space. It's called the Calorie Randomized Control Trial. It was published, I believe, in February of 2023. And you know, to everyone listening, it's probably no surprise that caloric restriction slows aging. But with the calorie trial, we have proof of that. It's the best established intervention for modifying the biology of aging and extending healthy lifespan. The NIA actually launched this trial to see if caloric restriction would work in humans as it does in C. elegans, Drosophila, and mice. 
All right. And you'll, you'll see a lot of press around this trial as well. So the question becomes, does caloric restriction lead to a better rate of aging? And it does. We would expect it to as well. However, which clocks are actually able to track this? And you can see the Horvath and Hannon clock, the first generation clocks, do not capture that change, which is a flaw of those first generation clocks, as we talked about. You have your second generation clocks. These ones are pretty popular. They were like the first iteration of second generation clocks, Pheno Age and Grim Age. Grim Age does decrease, but it's not statistically significant. However, that Deneened and Pace metric, that third generation clock is the only clock that shows consistent, statistically significant treatment effects, which was sustained across both time points. So that is something we want to look at as well. All right, the last point here, number five. We want to be able to explain why you're aging. This is something that could be frustrating at first to a lot of users when they used to get their biological age clock back and it was just a first generation clock and they may be asking, well, why am I aging? And you just would not know. We now know though, according to second generation clocks, what makes up your slower, hopefully, or faster, hopefully not aging process. So we know aging is a very heterogeneous process. Thus, aging can have different causes and phenotypes in, in, in many different directions. In previous clocks, again, we've been limited in telling you the why, why someone might be aging. Now, with new second generation clocks, as I mentioned previously, we have these epigenetic biomarker proxies to be able to tell you why you're aging. For example, we can now tell you what type of clinical factors or metabolites or proteins could be leading to your accelerated or decelerated deceler aging. Then we can make recommendations based on those scores. So here's just a quick image from our omic MH study we did with Harvard, where you can see the different body systems that contribute to the development of one of our second generation clock through omics. For example, we can quantify uh, an endocrine system, fasting glucose, HbA1c, androsterone sulfate, insulin-like growth factor binding protein 2, ribonuclease pancreatic, and ribitol as well. So if you have a grouping of those that may be out of range, according to our reporting, we may make recommendations on how you can actually improve those in your overall endocrine system. All right, so now you all understand what to look for in biological age clocks. So I now wanna ask the question, well, which clocks fit that criteria? What's out there on the market that can be clinically useful today for your patients? Again, to go through this, I place the biomarker criteria here along with um, the actual methylation clocks we believe fit this criteria. So we wanna make sure they're all published in peer reviewed journals and predictive of death and disease outcomes. We believe again, there are four clocks that we can start to look at these criteria through the lens of. That pace of aging I mentioned, that third generation clock, our omic M age and symphony age, and even grim age, which is uh, one of the original death predictors. All of these are published. All of these are predictive of death and disease outcomes, which is great. Number two, do they correlate with quality of life outcomes? I showed you an example from the Dedeaned and Pace, um, but they all check that box. Now, third, are they precise? Do they have that intraclass correlation coefficient value above 0 0.99? Absolutely, they do. Um, number four, do they respond to interventions that beneficially affect the biology of aging? Yes, we saw the Deneen and Pace do that in the example. Um, omic M age and Symphony age um, were not included in that calorie randomized control trial because they're newer clocks, but internal data suggests they do. And remember, Grim age didn't necessarily reach that significant, uh, statistically significant change with caloric restriction. Now, do they explain why you're aging? Deneen and Pace doesn't. That's just the nature of a third generation clock, unfortunately but omic M age, symphony age, and grim age all do. Now, what can true diagnostic offer you today? Well, we actually have three out of the four clocks here. These are our flagship clocks and the flagship reporting that we can offer you to make a change in your patient's life today.
Now, you do see telomere length here. We do offer telomere length testing as well through the lens of DNA methylation. However, it is just not as associated with lifespan and health span as we once thought it was. So we don't necessarily include it um, in, in our overall uh, workup when speaking with physicians. We think it's very crucial to focus on your omic MH, uh, Deneen Din Pace, and Symphony Age first. So I want to talk to you about these, these reports. Um, first, I want to talk to you about the omic MH. This is one I've been hinting at throughout the entire lecture. Now, when True Diagnostic was founded in 2020, we set out on a mission to create the best scientific algorithm or clock that analyzes epigenetic patterns to accurately quantify biological age. And to do this, we needed an extensive amount of data, which is why we partnered with researchers from Harvard University and Partners Biobank. The reason we did that is because the biobank included thousands of samples saved from over the last 50 years. And with these samples, we were able to collect an extensive amount of interconnected biodata needed to create the most accurate predictors of biological aging. This process has taken us almost three years to finalize, but we're super proud to have announced this in October of uh, 2023 um, to be the best biological age clock ever created, the omic M age algorithm itself. So what are some of the key features of omic M age? Well, I also mentioned this a little bit further. Here's a reporting example, um, but it's a multi-omic analysis where we examine a wide range of biologic, biologic data points, um, including hemoglobin, creatinine, triglycerides, fasting glucose, just to name a few, and some others you see on that right-handed side. It's really precise and accurate, offers one of the highest levels of predictive accuracy for biological aging and health outcomes, and it gives you those actionable insights. So it's providing those specific epigenetic biomarker recommendations based on your biological age and health markers. Now, secondarily, I want to talk to you about Deneen Din Pace. Here's an example of our Deneen Din Pace reporting. The Deneen Din Pace is one that we created with Duke and Columbia University. This one is really measuring a rate at which your body is aging. This test is super ideal for those who want to track the effectiveness of their lifestyle interventions over time. And by comparing your pace of aging to a standard calendar year, the pace provides a clear indication of whether your health efforts are slowing down or accelerating your biological aging. So again, some key features, it's, it's a rate, it's not a overall age. So this is determining how fast or slow your body's aging compared to that standard year. You can use it for regular monitoring. So it's ideal for tracking changes and improvements in your biological age over time. And it's giving you focused insights. So this is gonna help you understand in real time specific lifestyle interventions or supplements, medications, procedural based processes and how that's having an effect on your number one risk factor. Lastly, I want to talk about our Symphony Age we just released at the end of June. This is a really unique report. It's one we created with Yale. It offers a revolutionary way to understand aging across multiple organ systems, 11 to be in fact. This system-specific epigenetic aging algorithm evaluates how different parts of your body age both independently and together. So this analyzes a lot of different organs, such as your brain, liver, heart, immune system, and helps you pinpoint areas where targeted interventions can have the most significant impact. So it's very comprehensive. I mentioned 11 different organ systems. It helps you tailor health interventions by being more granular to specific areas of your health you may need to give some love and attention to. And then again, it's very detailed. It gives you in-depth insights into how each organ system is aging to, again, help with those personalized health strategies. So this is the idea that you can have someone at the same chronological age, for example, patient A, but they're a smoker and they're unhealthy. So they're going to have a higher lung and metabolic age. Whereas if you have patient B who eats a healthy diet and exercises, they're going to have a younger lung and metabolic age. This is what the reporting looks like. As I mentioned, we give you that lung, metabolic, musculoskeletal, blood, liver, inflammation, kidney, and heart hormone and immune system aging as well. So in order to look through that true age kit workflow and really get your hands on some of these, it's super easy in terms of the process from ordering the kits 
to registering them, collecting the sample um, with just a finger prick blood spot card, sending those samples back to us with our domestic return shipping label. And then you get results back in two to three weeks. And again, the key here is to really repeat this testing every six to 12 months. So remember, what you've really learned from this webinar is that we need to understand these biological aging algorithms and how they work, how they were created, because bad aging algorithms could lead to mad and lost patients. And that's the last thing we really want um, for you all to go through. So we're very, very clear and transparent on how these clocks are created and how they can benefit your patients' lives. Thank you. For any questions or issues you may have, please contact Avexia Diagnostics by email at info at aveciadiagnostics.com or by phone five days a week at extended hours, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time at 888-852-2723. Thank you, Hannah, for this informative presentation. Thank you all again for joining us for this webinar event. Until next time, from everyone at Avexia Diagnostics and True Diagnostics, Stay healthy, stay safe, and we wish you all the best on your pathway to wellness.